26-year-old Miguel Cotto has emerged as boxing's irresistible force. Miguel Cotto is systematic, seeking and destroying his opponent. You see the strength and power of Miguel Cotto. This is something entirely different. With heavy hands and an indomitable will, the Puerto Rican star has become the standard bearer for a boxing-mad island. Miguel is right in line to be the next great Puerto Rican fighter. Move over, Tito Trinidad. There's a new superstar in Puerto Rico. For New York native Zab Judah, superstardom once seemed like a foregone conclusion. Zab Judah was absolutely spectacular. Oh, huge left hand by Judah. That was a bomb. There were times where I was watching Zab Judah and my breath was taken away. You put a fast jab with a name like Zab, and you've got the beginnings of ring poetry. But Judah's early promise went unfulfilled, as his focus didn't always match his ability. Zab Judah has all the talent in the world, but for some reason, he can't put it together. He doesn't fight for three minutes of the round. Miguel Cotto does. On June 9th, a fighter who stands on the brink of joining boxing's elite faces his most dangerous foe to date. Miguel Cotto has never fought a fighter as good as Zab Judah, period. While an enigmatic former champion stands at the crossroads of his career. For Zab, this is potentially his last really big marquee fight. This is the countdown to Koto Judah. Zab Judah is back, training under the watchful eye of his father, Yoel, and preparing his body for Miguel Cotto. And in the streets of Brooklyn, they prepare the public for Zab's imminent trip back to his hometown. Fight down, baby, fight down! Wake up! Miguel Cotto, Zab Judah, do next! Madison Square Garden, here we go. Fight time. June 9th, June 9th. Good luck. All right. Fight so. down, baby. Fight what you need down, to know baby. about Zab Judah is Zab Judah is a Brooklyn kid. He's, he's, he's strictly Brooklyn. There you go. Uh, people know him. He's grown up here. I mean, this is home for him. While Brooklyn is in Zab's blood, fighting is in his genes. Zab and his nine brothers followed their father into the ring. The Judah clan is, is unique in that their father has a fighting background, a prize fighting background, if you will, but it's not boxing. His, his father was a kickboxer. I'm a seventh degree black belt, and I got a three world championships in kickboxing, full contact. While we was younger, he was a fighter himself, so he went to the gym every day. So he was like, all right, you know what? I'm going to work out. Y'all come with me. Y'all come in this gym. Y'all sit in that corner. Y'all chill. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, we like, chill, all right, whatever. Upon his retirement from fighting, Yoel focused on harnessing his son's talent. He dubbed his brood of fighters Team Judah. Always Team Judah, you know what I'm saying? Judah Brothers, Judah Brothers. When we hit New York City really hard, it was like around 92. I got nine of the sons. They fight too, but real talk, Zab was on the top of the heat. You know what I mean? He's, he, he, and he, he all, all his brothers came up with him, but he just shot past him. While he's laying on the, on the floor. Oh! And down goes Rand. Late 94, early 95, he started to really dominate guys. All his talent started to come together. Guys in his weight class would either move up or move down to try to avoid his weight class. The winner of the 139 pound novice class is from the gold corner. He was an excellent amateur. I saw a guy who reminded me in a way of Pernell Whitaker. In the mid-1990s, Whitaker was a slick southpaw known for his defensive prowess. Being compared to him was high praise for any young fighter. His style was like, it was just amazing to me. The man would literally stand in front of you and you can't touch him, can't, can't touch him. And I was like, I wanna be like that. As a 1996 Olympic hopeful, Zab got the opportunity to train with Whitaker. We had a trainer, Ronnie Shields, and Ronnie used to be like, Zab, you boxing with Pete today. So I get in there, 
And the bell sing ding, and I'm just standing there like, okay, what should I do? Like, should I hit him? Like, I love this guy right here, you know? What should I do? And he just clocked me, wow! I was like, oh man, let's go now, you know? And then we just started going. It was no big secret that Zab Judah, as an amateur, was actually sparring with Pernell Whitaker. And the stories were that he would hold his own. Zab was set to become boxing's next young star, and the Olympics were going to be his stage. If everything goes right like I wanted to, I'll make the Olympic team and I'll win a gold medal. However, Judah's plans went horribly awry at the Olympic trials when he lost to David Diaz and failed to even make the team. At the time of his hurt, I was going to quit boxing. Well, you know, I tell him, listen, man, you know, you got to stay strong. You got to go back to the joint, boy, and just go harder. Zab Judah's pursuit of stardom would have to wait until he could break into the professional ranks. For Miguel Cotto, stardom has arrived. It's a mantle he embraces every spring during New York City's Puerto Rican Day Parade. To understand the adulation, one must travel 1,600 miles south to an island where boxers are more than just athletes and where boxing is more than just a sport. El público se identifica mucho con las personas porque ellos hacen sus iconos, sus estrellas. Es algo que que generación tras generación pues le ha fascinado y, y hemos tenido una cantidad de, de grandes y excelentes campeones. It's a major sport there. It is indeed part of the culture, and they've had truly great fighters. Wilfredo Gomez, Wilfredo Benitez, and of course, Felix Tito Trinidad. It's a special thing, and Miguel Cotto is, as of this moment, the special Puerto Rican fighter. Just south of Puerto Rico's capital city of San Juan lies the city of Caguas, home of the Gimnasio Beiroa. Inside, Miguel Cotto trains for his June 9th fight with Zab Judah. Here is where Miguel Cotto made the national passion his own. My hermanos comenzaron en lo que en lo que era el boxeo. Yo pues traté de como típico hermano menor de hacer lo que lo que ellos hacían. Tenía unas cuantas libritas de sobrepeso cuando pues cuando tenía 11 años y y aparte después de seguir a mis hermanos pues lo utilicé como método método para rebajar. On this day, as Miguel spars, Uncle Evangelista Cotto watches closely. It's a familiar position for the man who has trained Miguel since day one. Bueno, este, recuerdo yo cuando los primeros guanteos, él eh, bajaba del ring llorando, pues demostraba que, pues, que, te, que tenía. No era de los que lloran y se quitan y no quieren seguir, sino que él quería seguir adelante. Pues, y de ahí adelante, pues, me dije a mí mismo que eso era lo que, lo que, lo que quería hacer en mi vida, boxeador. As a teenager, Cotto quickly emerged as one of Puerto Rico's greatest amateur talents. Miguel, from an early age, showed his potential. Uh, from 97, 98, he, he was regarded as the biggest prospect in boxing here in Puerto Rico. He was the main hope for Puerto Rico to win a, a medal in boxing in the two, 2000 Olympics. Todo atleta era una Olimpiada y representar a, a su país y, y... Fue, fue en mi paso por el boxeo aficionado fue mi logro eh, más importante. But Cotto's Olympic dreams ended suddenly after a first round loss to eventual gold medalist Mohamed Abdullayev. It was a big disappointment at that moment because uh, nobody knows uh, that Abdullayev was going to, to be the Olympic champion. But as soon as he picked up the gold medal, all the people, including me, said, hey, this kid, Lost with the champion, he's going to be a hell of a boxer. Despite the Olympic disappointment, Cotto's pro prospects seemed bright, much like another former amateur standout who was already turning heads. You look at Zab Judah, and you see the kind of very rare blend of phenomenal speed and power and sheer athleticism that says this guy can be great. Judah used his physical talents to win his first 16 fights, yet in June of 1998, his 17th opponent had his own set of formidable skills. Mickey Ward was a guy with a well-earned reputation for being tough, definitely somebody 
who uh, wasn't afraid to battle back if punches were put on him. He had this famous liver shot that <clears throat> I still feel it today. Hey, so, every time I mention it, I just I still feel it. Judah withstood Ward's money punch to win a 12-round decision, and within two years, he captured his first 140-pound title belt. Zab was undefeated, and his flamboyance attracted a following. He basically appealed to the hip-hop generation, and the bling, and the jewelry, the teeth, the whole thing. You know, he's showing up on mixtapes, showing up in hip-hop videos. He can talk. He has a great smile. He uh, is fun to be around. Zab has the kind of personality that can get your attention. In the late 90s, he sort of became a part of Mike Tyson's entourage. And Zab Judah started to pick up a lot of that Mike Tyson swagger. I idolized that man a lot. You know, I learned so much from that guy, too. Tyson was like a big brother. He always felt, eh, let me bring the kid with me here, let me bring him here. Whenever he was around Brooklyn, Zab couldn't wait to hang out with him. In November of 2001, Zab brought Tyson with him for the biggest fight of his career, a 140-pound unification showdown with powerful punching Kostya Zhu. Kostya Zhu was a three-to-one underdog, and if you would have asked Zab Judah going into the fight, Kostya Zhu should have been a 30-to-one Underdog. This was going to be his emergence as a superstar. And the first round went really well for him. I thought that, you know, it looked like, okay, maybe this is going to be Zab's fight. Zab is destroying Costa Zoo. He's like running circles around this guy. And I go to the corner, I'm like, yo, I got this dude, yo. And my father, like, no. Keep your hands up, stay focused, handle your business first. And I'm like, yeah, all right, whatever. So I go out there, drop my hands, start backing up, looking pretty, just kind of styling on him, looking, you know what I'm saying? I go backwards, and he caught me, bop! Kasha Zhu landed a very accurate right hand. It just landed on the button, and Zab was separated from his senses. The mistake of Zab Judah was he didn't give himself time to, to gather himself. People that know me, my will and my heart doesn't allow me to sit on the ground. So I jumped up, and then my equilibrium wasn't good yet. Zab's lack of bodily control gave referee Jane Nady no choice but to stop the fight. No, no. Sorry. A disappointed Judah violently expressed his displeasure with the decision. That, I think, was the first time I realized how immature and how inappropriate Zab could be at fierce competitive moments. And, and I was mad because I was like, this is an opportunity. I worked so hard for this. And I, I kind of let my emotion oversee myself. And I went to, I, I went to referee Jay Nady. And to this day, you know, I apologize, Jay Nady. I was bitter at the end of the day. And you, know, you worked your whole life to this goal. And in two rounds, it's over. As a result of his actions, Zab was suspended for six months and fined $75,000. What should have been Zab Judah's crowning moment started a mini riot in the ring. And I would say from that point, November 2001, Zab's career has been up and down ever since. As Judah took a forced break from the sport, 20-year-old Miguel Cotto embarked on his professional journey. Here is this guy who was a hotshot amateur, did not get to a medal round at the Olympic Games. But there was always that talk of people saying the best prospect from the 2000 Olympics is Miguel Cotto of Puerto Rico. We have a great, great expectation about, about Miguel in that particular point of his career, that he will be champion of the world. Definitely. But after six pro fights, it appeared as if those expectations might never be realized. While driving to an early morning training session, Cotto fell asleep at the wheel of his car. The ensuing crash severely injured his right arm and left his career in limbo. But when I went to the hospital, they explained me in detail, I realized that the lesson was quite serious. And then we started to worry about it. The arm was broken in three pieces. Down, down, and almost reaching the knee. That's how you, you, your instrument of work. And, and a lot of people believe that it was 
Not the end of the career, but he was not going to be the Miguel Cotto that everybody sees. Pensé que todo se había ido, a, se había tirado al olvido, todo se había tirado al zapacón. Los médicos me dieron año y medio para comenzar a entrenar nuevamente. Miguel's very tough mentally. That mindset, I think, helped overcome that. Within 30 days, he was running. Within five months, he was fighting. Cotto returned to the ring more than a year ahead of schedule and regained his pre-injury form in patient and punishing fashion. A knockout on a body shot for Miguel Cotto. It may sound a little cruel, but it feels good when you connect a blow to your opponent, and that provokes pain. As Cotto earned recognition, he also faced the inevitable comparisons to his iconic Puerto Rican predecessor, Felix Trinidad. He is the next guy to come out of Puerto Rico following Felix Trinidad, and uh, those are big shoes to fill. No fighter should envy the amount of pressure and attention that Miguel Cotto has on his shoulders. People were expecting him to be the next great champion from Puerto Rico. He has a, such a different personality uh, from Trinidad that I thought it was going to be very difficult. He's not an emotional guy as Trinidad, eh, eh, Viva Puerto Rico, and so on. Uh, so he's a shy guy. He's an introvert. He was very careful to shunt aside the Trinidad comparisons and focus on being Miguel Cotto. In September of 2004, Cotto took another step towards blazing his own path when he faced a man who beat him twice in the amateurs, undefeated Brazilian knockout artist, Kelson Pinto. In many people's eyes, this was the first significant test for Miguel Cotto. But in that fight, in front of his people, Miguel Cotto was absolutely sensational. And there is a hard right hand followed by the left hook. The one, two, puts Pinto down. Pinto slightly wobbly now. He broke down Kelson Pinto. This barrage of right hands may wind up ending the fight. He showed dimensions that Kelson simply didn't have. Move over, Tito Trinidad. There's a new superstar in Puerto Rico. He came up big. He created high expectations for himself because of the manner in which he destroyed Kelson Pinto. After the Kostya Zoo suspension, Zab Super Judah returned to the ring, eager to live up to his nickname. There were some flashes of brilliance. Judah hooking and now hits Curly with a big left flush on the chin. And some not so super moments. Down comes Judah on a left. You sometimes wonder about the commitment level. Sometimes you see his brilliance, and then other times you just feel totally frustrated. Sometimes you're going to get the good Zab Judah, and sometimes you're going to get the bad Zab Judah. In February 2005, a focused and motivated Judah showed up to knock out Corey Spinks for the undisputed welterweight championship. But less than a year later, Judah relinquished it with an uninspired performance against Carlos Baldemir. Carlos Baldemir, here's a fighter, had no business beating Zab Judah. Absolutely no business beating Zab Judah. Carlos Baldemir, if something don't spark me, something don't excite me, I don't get up for it. Despite the loss, Zab's box office appeal remained strong, and in April 2006, Floyd Mayweather chose to face Judah. Zab Judah, who brings his A game, he's still dangerous for any fighter in the world, including Floyd Mayweather. Just thinking about what could happen with those two guys, that people still want to see it. You just want to see it. There's this notion that one of these nights, uh, the Zab Judah who should beat everybody in the world is going to show up and, and fulfill all that. I knew I could beat Floyd, you know what I'm saying? I know I was bigger, I knew I was mean, I knew I hit harder, I knew I was faster. We had such a big build-up, I wanted to hurt Floyd. I came out, boom, grenades. hand over the top by Judah. He believes he's got no other hurt. We saw for the first time, perhaps, somebody in the ring with Floyd Mayweather who was faster than Mayweather. Somebody who was able to beat Mayweather to the punch. Somebody who was able to get in Floyd's head a little bit. Judah's early pace was inspired, 
but could not be maintained as the fight moved to the later rounds. And keep walking to him. You keep pressing, he can't fight. Mayweather just followed his corner's advice. Pressure him, Roger Mayweather told Floyd. Just pressure him. Getting increasingly worse for Tuna as Mayweather is simply chasing him around the ring and punishing him now. By the time the 10th round began, uh, there was certainly no question in my mind who had won the fight. We were going to see three more Floyd Mayweather rounds on our way to the finish. That was, that was what I anticipated. Mayweather had taken control of the bout, but with 10 seconds left in the 10th round, the fight took a painful turn. is badly hurt by the low blow. Well, if it was on purpose, it is as classless as anything we've seen from a fighter in recent years. The low blow was unintentional, you know what I'm saying? I can't regret throwing it because I didn't mean to throw it. You know what I'm saying? I regret that it turned out the way it did. And now Roger Mayweather wants to come after Zap. Roger Mayweather, she never came in that ring. But yo, but you're not gonna touch my son. I'm not gonna have it. The committee said, oh, why you should have left, left the referee handed. What, don't let him beat my son now? I'm not like y'all. I'm not built like that. Then I just see like a little scuffle. I'm, I'm thinking like Leonard's over there, Roger over there, and my father. You know what I'm saying? That's, that's my father, and I'm not gonna stand and let nothing happen to him. And a riot is gonna break out in the ring. When the riot broke out and everything happened, I stayed calm. I ain't finna get involved with this shit and fuck my money up. Man, listen, it, what we got is bigger than money. What me and my father got is bigger than money. When we, you, you can have all the money. You're not gonna hurt my father, or you're not gonna see nobody hurt me. They endangered themselves, and they endangered everybody who was in and around that ring. That was a mini riot in the ring that was very close to becoming a major riot outside of the ring. When the official fight resumed, Mayweather went on to win a 12-round decision. A month later, the Nevada Athletic Commission decided on Judah's punishment, $250,000 and a one-year suspension. I want to thank the Nevada Commission because they helped me, man. They, you know what I'm saying? They put me on a little timeout, and it, it, it got me good. It got, it got my mom right. It got me a chance to shake off a couple of bad loose. And now I'm back. Zab is up against the wall. You know, Zab knows that he's had three strikes. He can't afford another strike against him. It's how you come back. You get suspended. It's how you come back. You know what I'm saying? And that's what we're about to prove to the world, how that, why they call him the comeback kid from BK. Come on, what we do? beginning with Miguel Cotto. Miguel Cotto himself is no stranger to adversity in the ring. Just two years ago, while one of boxing's top prospects, he was still far from perfect. He gets ripped again and down goes Miguel Cotto. He's got to take some punishment to give the punishment that he's going to give, and, and that's his weakness. He was exposed in that regard against Ricardo Torres. You sit there and you say to yourself, he gets hit a little bit too much. He gets hit a little bit too much for a guy that's supposed to be elite. He punched. Corley has hurt Cotto. Miguel Cotto's in trouble and is holding on. People saw his vulnerability, and people think that, well, maybe he's not what we thought he was. Cotto had something to prove. In December 2006, he stepped up to welterweight and took on undefeated countryman Carlos Quintana for a vacant title belt. In the eyes of many, Cotto was the underdog. Quintana had scored a big victory over an extremely ballyhooed prospect named Joel Julio from Colombia. Quintana was able to outbox him, and I think a lot of people thought, well, he's the better boxer. He's going to do the same thing to Cotto. Before the fight, we did a poll with different trainers here in Puerto Rico, and just one big Cotto. I had the opportunity to titular in his career. La tuvo frente a Miguel Cotto y todos pensaron que iba a salir victorioso. Was no contest. No contest. He let everybody know who the best Puerto Rican welterweight was. It wasn't Quintana. Quintana was absolutely brutalized. When Cotto hit Quintana with one of those perfect left hooks to the body in the fifth round, Quintana felt the kind of pain he hadn't felt before. Everything was unveiled that night. He had the perfect fight, maybe the greatest fight of his career. Break his ribs. Keep busting him up, busting him up. Zab Judah has to realize that this is his last chance. When he says to himself, 
If I lose this fight, my career could be over. You're gonna see the best of Zab Judah. No matter what you do to me, you can't keep me down. I'm gonna pop up and come back somehow. If Miguel Cotto can take whatever Zab Judah has a dish out and can win impressively, I think he will silence a lot of his critics. Cotto is about to join the elite. He's right there, he's knocking on the door. The expectations are so high, and Miguel Cotto is prepared for it. There's a lot at stake for Cotto in terms of fame, glory, and money. There's a lot at stake for Judah in terms of career survival. On Saturday, June 9th, the countdown concludes for Miguel Cotto and Zab Judah. Zab Judah is the most talented and perhaps the most experienced fighter that Miguel Cotto has ever faced. I got hands beat, I got power. I'm mean, I'm mad, I'm on a vengeance. I got something to get. Su carrera no ha tenido el coraje y la estamina y las agallas. If Zab can't prove in the first two or three rounds that his punch is too big, he's going to be like most Cotto opponents, on the wrong side of a rising time. Thousands make fights. You got the matador on the ball. They're gonna come to fight. For as long as it lasts, it's gonna be fun. Live boxing on HBO returns June 16th with a Boxing After Dark doubleheader. The main event features 140-pound title holder Love More Endo against Pali Malinaji. One week later, two more top 140-pounders meet. Longtime champion Ricky Hatton faces former lightweight champ Jose Luis Castillo. Live on HBO June 23rd.